So you can tell me I'm great all you want, but you're not pursuing me and I know why. Because I require too much and that's all right. I'm okay with that. The right person is gonna see me and I don't mind being ignored by everybody else. With my ex-husband because we met on Match.com, so a lot of people didn't understand why I went. Wait, Wait you, you was on Match? Yes, I was. I would not have believed, I'm like, <laughs> What is this catfish? S right. Oh, swipe left. Fake. I'll reveal to you guys. I, I discovered porn when I was a child. I believe that pornography was keeping me and helping me abstain. Where is your identity coming from? Is it coming from what this man across from you, this eligible bachelor thinks? Or is your identity coming from the Lord God who made you? There's no amount of dinners that you will ever buy for me that will get my panties off. This is not the after dark show. I'm not even going <laughs> to right, right. right. <laughs> But at this point, that's very important to you that you abstain all the way to marriage. I'm nodding and <laughs> sometimes I'll be like, Lord, it's really difficult. I'm standing on what you asked me to do and it's real lonely. Welcome to Hardly Initiated. It is your host, Tyshawn Jackson, here with another episode of my co-host, Ryan Ketchins. Let me say, so the platform continues to be blessed and today yes. is very special. I'm excited about this one. This yeah. is a very <laughs> groundbreaking day in hardly initiated history, guys. It is, it's really, I keep laughing because day. It's, it's legendary. Just Truth. put the camera on this beautiful Hi. presence <laughs> that has entered hardly initiated studios today because I don't think I need a major introduction for this wonderful presence because you have been in all of our lives for quite some time now. Y'all yeah. know this face? <laughs> if y'all yes. know this face, put a yes right now in the comment <laughs> section because we are here with Essence Atkins. Welcome Thank to you. Hardly Initiated. Thank you, Tyshawn. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I'm super excited to be here. I my my face actually hurts a little bit. My cheeks are hurting from smiling so big. I like oh, wow. that. Yeah. I me like too. that. And get, let me tell y'all. Y'all know Essence. She's one of the, I mean, probably one of the most profound actresses of our generation. Legendary. And she's nervous. She said she was nervous. I am. About I am. being on the hardly initiated <laughs> platform. Ladies, y'all hear that? Yeah. <laughs> stay, stay nervous. Stay nervous, stay nervous. ladies. We like stay that. Nervous. I like that. <laughs> How you uh, feeling? I feel really amazing. I feel great. I'm so, The energy in this room is incredible. And um, I'm excited. I'm excited for what the Holy Spirit's going to do. And and what we're gonna talk about, though we haven't discussed it, so whatever you guys see, just know it's spontaneous. Mm. We're baking this bread fresh, y'all. Fresh, mm -hmm. and we got something <laughs> up our sleeves for this young lady here with us. <laughs> because, man, Essence, let, let, let's actually get the audience to know you a little bit better as well, okay. because I don't know if they know your story. They see you on the camera, they mm -hmm. see you on the other side of the screen, but they don't know. So just for context, Essence, you are currently, you have one child so far mm -hmm. in your life right now. And you were previously married. I was. As well. How long ago, by the way, were you married? Uh, I divorced in 2016. I was married in 2009. Um, and my son is 11. He'll be 12 on Christmas Day. So. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So from 2009, you got married mm -hmm. to 2016. Mm -hmm. So about sev seven years? Yeah, we were married seven years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Tell me about that. So married for seven years. Mm -hmm. Why are you like, what, what happened? Oh gosh. You know, I think, I think that we weren't really clear as to who the other person was and what was good for the other person. Mm. I really, you know, I, I think that Love was there, but we didn't have the skill set or the tools or even the awareness of what the other person really needed, and it failed because of that. And I also believe that we didn't have enough of God at the helm to resuscitate us when we were dying. Mm. Yeah. God at the helm. Mm -hmm. Was he somebody who you would consider to be a man of God prior to you guys, prior to you guys getting married? I mean, we had premarital counseling by our pastor. He, we would go to church together. So um, my ex-husband went to 12 years of Catholic school. So, you know, it was an active, we were both actively Christians. But I think that there's a difference between, there's a difference between knowing God, right, and as Lord, and having s submitted your life to him as savior, there's a difference. 
Mm. Um, and I, and I say that because it's like, there's not too many places in the world where you can go where people don't know Oprah. They know who Oprah Winfrey is. They know what she's accomplished. They know she had a show. She owned a network. She has magazines. She's, she endorses books. She gave cars away. There's a lot of things that the average person would know about Oprah Winfrey, but that doesn't mean they can call her up. Mm. And I think that as Christians, we aren't always aware that we are to be cultivating a relationship with God. It's not enough to just know him. That may be enough for glory, but while we're still here on earth, it is incumbent upon us to cultivate that relationship so that when we, when we need him, really, and, and marriage is something that I think that we need God and we need to be in partnership with God in, in terms of how to navigate it because we're people, we're growing, we're fallible, we're flawed, and we can't always look for instruction from others we kind of got to get back to like well what's the instruction what's the way to handle this and I don't think we did that enough and that's what I'm gonna say about that in honor of my ex-husband and my son you know I I know that people go into relationships and they go into divorces and they talk a lot about what went wrong or what their feelings are about it and that's fine but for me I love the relationship that I have with my ex-husband as my son's father. He's a great father. And so I really try to honor that and respect, as, as celebrities like to say, respect our privacy. You right, know, our, right. As a couple, we weren't really out there, but this was also kind of before the influx of everyone putting everything out there. And I think that's, it's really a cautionary tale because when you make your relationship, when you make your relationship public, then it does become fodder for public consumption. And it's hard for to ask people to then like respect your privacy when you've made your courtship and your romance so public. So, you know, it's a bit of a kind of dichotomy and it's a bit of a stretch. I mean, you everyone has the right, of course, to keep things amongst themselves. But I think we also have to understand what we are kind of agreeing to when we put our relationships out there. Because once you put it out, you want to know everything. Yeah. From the people, people are invested in your story. They're like, well, what happened? <laughs> right, you know exactly. what I mean? So, exactly. so, yeah. It becomes a movie. It becomes a movie. Mm. You know, we all, I mean, Andy Warhol said it way before it's time that one day we would all have our own channel. And we all do. Wow. Literally. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting because, you know, just women with followings in general, mm -hmm. I personally have always wanted to stay away from. Just mm. personally. Mm. And mainly because that is one of, was always one of my concerns mm -hmm. in the back of my mind. Mm -hmm. You know, want, like my relationship being something that is public mm -hmm. and that everybody is, is weighing in on. Is mm -hmm. weighing in on. Yeah. I mean, it happened a little bit with my ex husband because we met on a. Uh, Match.com, and this is way before people were meeting on sites, so a lot of people didn't understand it's why I was. Wait, you, you was on Match? I was. I would not have believed. I'm like, <laughs> what is this catfish? S right. It's my breath. Fake. That well, blows my it, mind. I, it, well, here's the thing. I was on there without a picture. So I wrote this really, like, funny insightful deep profile and most people dismissed it because there was no picture first of all it has to be a picture that is scammy there was no picture but so what i would do because i knew that it wasn't gonna it wasn't gonna garner a lot of interest is i would reach out to people and i would say something clever or whatever and i would say read my profile if you like my profile i will send you a picture and then people would be like ah what's behind our number three you know what I mean but I knew that I didn't want to invite disingenuous people by putting my picture up because there's a lot especially now but even back then there's a lot of things that you can kind of think you know about me based on my public persona and I didn't want to I didn't want to attract people I'm still very much that way like I'm not particularly comfortable attracting people based on my resume, based on what I do for a living, or based on how I look. So I, I, I generally, my friends will tell you, most of the time I walk around and I'm very low key. I have sweats on. You know, I look like a soccer mom. I have, you know, jeans on and like my Jordans and a baseball cap and no makeup. That's, I look like I could beat you in a foot race almost at any given <laughs> time of day, most of the time, because I also don't like the attention that I get without a covering. 
to be honest. Like, mm-hmm. I, you know, when I look like this, when people recognize me readily and, it, and I attract more of attention, I, it makes me uncomfortable because I don't have a covering. Like, I, I'm not particularly fond of that, of those eyes, because it makes me feel very kind of, um, vulnerable is the wrong word, but it makes me feel targeted. Mm. And I don't like it. So unless I am going somewhere for work or I'm with a group of people, I will shy away from walking around with makeup on and hair done and all that other stuff. Cause I don't, I don't want to, I want I'd rather be inconspicuous. So you met your husband on match. I did. That's shocking. Honestly, mm-hmm. do, do you, I mean, thinking about, uh, thinking back on that, cause we have a, a, a large following mm-hmm. that many of the ladies particularly are extremely apprehensive about meeting people online. And there's reason, I mean, there's good cause, right? right. Uh, you know, especially with our awareness of human trafficking and, you know, people setting up fake profiles, you have to be, you have to be cautious. It's, it's wise to be cautious. You know, back then, what I loved about it was that I could be very specific. Like I liked that I could say, oh, I was looking for someone who was a Christian, who was this, who was within this age range. And I could do it from my house. You know, it's kind of like, ah. Uh, I like this, this, you know, the menu. I like, I like the menu options from my bed. <laughs> um, but I haven't really been back online since my divorce because I do think that it's dangerous and it can be dangerous. And, you know, so there's a reason that people are skeptical. But it does work. It does work. There's plenty of successful relationships that have come out of apps. Yeah. But back then when I was doing it, people were like, what's wrong with her? Can't she just meet somebody the old fashioned way in the grocery store, or get fixed up? Like you, if you were to go back and look, look at those comments in 2008, you would see a very different environment. Whereas most people, that is how they meet. They meet in some sort of online way. And well, see, that's the thing. You were, you know, was looking for love in 06. 07? I went on, on oh, in 07. Yeah, I met him in 08. Mm-hmm. And looking for love in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> it's a little different. Okay? I don't know that I'm looking anymore. I feel like I'm waiting. What's the difference? Um, I get to kind of own my feminine energy a little bit more in waiting. And I trust God more in waiting. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like, okay, the right person is going to see me. Whereas I feel like before it was like, see me you know what I mean now it's like the right person is gonna see me and I don't mind being ignored by everybody else do you think that's that strategy is applicable to to everyone you think everybody could have success waiting and maybe not putting themselves out as much I think that there's work to be done and there's a level of trust to be developed you know what I mean and that's where I'm at like I'm I'm doing the work I've done the work of who I want to be and how I want to live and cultivating my own joy and having relationships that are platonic and, and, and valuing those things and enriching my own life. And I think that that is the way to attract the best partner for me to be where I want to be in my life without a partner and then attract a partner who is like-minded who is also where they want to be, who also has their own joy, their own relationships, their own ambitions, separately than just couple them. So you, you're really working, not really waiting. Working on me. Right. Yeah. I, I think when people may hear the waiting part, they literally, like, on the couch, <laughs> waiting. <laughs> <laughs> and they're waiting for Prince Charming to come rescue well, them, you know, rather than I, doing those kind of investments that, that you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that's also stagnancy. You know, and that's how you atrophy, like sitting on the couch. What is that good for? Really? Like, it's not good for us physically. It's not good for us mentally. If you're upset, they tell you, go take a walk, that it'll help regulate your emotions. It'll help with your with your hormones. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Like, if you want to get fit or be more healthy or live longer, we have to create bone density, especially as we age. So it's important that we weight train, that we resistance train. It's like sedentary is really not a healthy state. You know, stagnant water starts to stink. There's a, we're meant to be moving in some way. And that doesn't mean that stillness is bad. It's, it's, there's a difference, you know. It's not, stillness isn't bad, but it is about stagnancy and waiting for someone to rescue you, waiting for an opportunity. Like, there is work to be done. Faith without works is dead. There's work to be done for all of us to have the life that we, that we dream of. 
the life that we daydream about, the life that we want. We have to actively participate. And it's not a genie in a bottle. So when you say personally for you, because I want to bring it down to earth for the okay. people. When you say do the work, mm. that could be something different based on where, you know, different people are in their lives. Absolutely. What was the work for you? I mean, the work is always introspection. The work is always accountability, you know, finding out where and 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 also like in the process of therapy or in the process of like self-discovery of of identifying like why do you, you one of the great tools of being an actor is that we constantly have to ask the why right what's your motivation now you, you guys have heard that even in the secular world not being actors what's your motivation so we're constantly seeking the motivation of our characters why did they say that why did they do that why did they not say why did they lie you know what, behaviorally and so i have that practice as a way of making an a living and being a storyteller, it's important that I turn that on myself, right? That I continue to do that. And there are things that I needed to uncover, particularly going back to your question <clears throat> uh, after my marriage was over. There were things that I had to uncover and work on and kind of examine about what I was attracted to, what I was comfortable in, all of those things and why. And I had to heal those things. And I had, some of that stuff re required excavation, but it's all, mm. there's always work to be done uh, unless we just want to kind of dull ourselves and numb ourselves. No, that's, that may, no, that makes a lot of sense. And I, I know Ryan made a really good point because when I hear a lot of people, when I, they use the, the word like, I'm, I'm doing the work, I'm healing, I'm doing, I feel like when you ask somebody what it is, they should be able to give you some tangible, yes, some tangible answers Absolutely. to what that'll look like. Absolutely. And typically, if you ask somebody, you'll get a lot of ramble. <laughs> or, or it's something related to investing in their business or mm. doing something work related. Right, right, right. Yes, that's typical. Yeah. No, because that, that's you, what the work is. The work is getting money. Right. Yeah. The work is not dating. Right. Some people think like because they're not dating anybody all together. Right. They're working on themselves because they've just pulled out of the game altogether, which that's a part of it. Mm -hmm. Right. Like the some aspect of a detox. But mm -hmm. when you remove something, you got to put something else there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's that's the part that's typically also missing. And you mentioned um, developing your platonic platonic relationships, mm -hmm. which I, I do understand. I want to understand more about platonic relationships. Like, what do you mean by working on the platonic relationships? But you mentioned introspection, mm -hmm. working on the platonic relationships. And what, what was the other things that you mentioned? Uh, probably something about cultivating joy. OK. You know, and also excavating, like examining the things that have happened in your past. Right. I including what is really necessary and kind of operating subconsciously in a lot of us, which is childhood stuff, right? To kind of unearth that stuff and look at it and heal and kind of um, restore if there's possibilities for restoration in terms of broken relationships within your family. I think all of those really do inform us as potential partners and definitely as parents, we have to kind of address those things of what we learned, what we absorbed, what we adopted as normal that may have been dysfunctional and, t and start to peel those things away. Mm. Okay, so let's talk about platonic relationships. Okay. Because right now the rhetoric based on what's seen on social media mm. is that men and women can't be platonic friends. The reason being, is this is what's stated, mm -hmm. that if a woman is platonic friends with a man, he's only waiting until he gets the opportunity <laughs> to sleep with his I, woman. You know, I can't speak to the male psychology. Okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so, oh, I'm so, not, that, so I'm that. not okay. even going to try. Okay. But I'll take Marlon as an example. So Marlon Waynes and I met on the set uh, in 1995 on the set of The Waynes Brothers. At that time, I was cast to play Sean's girlfriend, one of his many, I'm sure, revolving door right. girlfriends or dates or whatever on the show. And I worked with Kim Waynes, Sean Waynes, and Marlon. And um, had a great time. Went back to New York. I was still living in New York at the time. And moved to California. The next time I worked with Marlon was on, I want to say, Dance Flick? Yeah. The next time I worked with Marlon was on Dance Flick. And Marlon, 
I believe was a producer. Keenan was a producer directed by Mike Titus. I worked with Sean again. I played Sean's love interest because, you know, I was Carrie Washington. I was like a Carrie Washington S from Save the Last Dance. That was what my character was loosely based on in um, in that movie. And so I worked with him again. And then um, I had I got married, had my son and worked with Marlon on Haunted House. And it was the first time that Marlon and I were played were playing love interests. And I, my son was literally six weeks old when I started that movie. He was six weeks and one day old. And I had had to have an emergency cesarean. So I was like delirious. I was breast, I was pumping. I was doing my own stunts. <laughs> I was working with Marlon, who was like, you know, just ADHD on a thousand and, you know, trying to keep up and trying to be funny. And, you know, I had, I was postpartum with the, with the weight, you know, and all that kind of stuff. So wow. yeah, if you look at that movie, seriously, if you look at like the poster, my boobs are <laughs> <laughs> they're you know just engorged with because I was my son was a baby and um and we were one day we're sitting in the trailer and he asked me how I was doing and I I was having a hard day I was sleep deprived whatever and he was like one day you and I are going to work together you're going to play my wife and I said oh my god I would he's like we're going to do a tv show together and I was like I would love that that would be amazing he's like yay that was 2012 and when we did the Marlin show, it was 2016. And I booked that job three weeks after filing for divorce. And on the Marlin show, Marlin and I played newly divorced couple, mm. co-parenting, raising our two kids and trying to figure out what life looks like after divorce. It was the most kismet, the most incredible miracle for me. At that time, it was the most money I'd ever made doing a show with one of my favorite people on the planet. But I bring all this up to say that the first time we worked together was what? 1995. We ended up doing a series together, which was technically our fourth project together, our fifth project, sorry, our fifth project together in 2016. And I have a new show, which I can talk about now that the strike is over. I have a new <laughs> show that'll be coming out in 24, 25 for CBS with Damon Waynes. I'll be doing a show with Damon and Damon Jr. I say all this to say, had I not understood the importance of business relationships and being platonic, even with somebody who was single, attractive, somebody dope, somebody that I vibe with, I don't think that all of these blessings that I have had through that family would have happened. But I had wisdom. And I know that Marlon is an amazing, amazing person, but he is not my partner. And I'm so grateful that I had that discernment and that I had that discipline to know he's dope. He's amazing. He's funny. He's fine. He's talented. He's all these things. But he is not my partner. And I would have forfeited so many incredible blessings had I slept with him. Mm. I really don't think that Marlon would have been in Damon's ear like, I don't know why you casting. You need to hire Essence. Damon told me. Marlon has been telling him for months that he needed to see me for this role. He finally saw me, and in my screen test with Damon, he said, now I understand what my brother was talking about. You're dope. But that would have been a compromised advocacy if I had slept with him. Wow. It's really important to have discipline and discernment. It's really important to weigh what is at stake because once you have that, once you cross that line, it's very hard to walk that thing back. Very, if not impossible. Right. And and again, how much money, um, acclaim, opportunity, I would have forfeited if I had been short-sighted. If I had just been like, well... You know, we're drunk. Let's hook up. Like, no, <laughs> you got that. And it's part of why there's so many things about so many parameters that are talked about in the word about just being sober minded. It's not, again, just about not drinking. It's about like thinking about things in the chess way, not in the checker way. You got to be intentional. Are you serious about your future? I'm serious about my future. I'm serious about what I want. I'm serious about the dreams that I have. And I don't want to do things that put myself in jeopardy of achieving those things. I believe in myself enough. I believe in myself enough. I like mm. that. I, I like that, that mindset. It's a sober mindset that you mentioned. Now, 
you got you personally operating with this level of discipline, mm -hmm. right? And 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 honor honor yourself mm -hmm. and and what you have to offer, mm -hmm. right? But you know, in the dating marketplace, you got these you got men that that are interested. Mm -hmm. They see all of these other very successful, handsome, so and so men that you're around, mm -hmm. and it could cause some level of insecurity or mm -hmm. frustration. Mm -hmm. Just generally, even though you you know essence is operating with integrity with integrity right there can still be some level of insecurity mm -hmm. so in a relationship whether it's dating or somebody involved in a you know long-term intimate relationship mm -hmm. who's responsible for how that insecurity is addressed is it solely up to the man in the relationship to deal with it or are there things that maybe the woman can do to make her man feel a bit more comfortable about the situation i i think it's both I mean, isn't that partnership? Mm. What concerns you should concern me. What bothers you, I should at least attempt to minimize triggering that, right? Minimize um, activating that. Um, but it's also your responsibility to tell me, to be honest about those things, not to mask them, you know, to have, to trust me enough. And then again, I got, that's what I'm saying, it goes back and forth because I also have to create an environment where you feel safe enough to trust me with what's happening. You know, oh, I was activated here. You know, I was around, I was around D Wade and all those ball players who have millions, hundreds of millions of dollars. And I felt some type of way. And then I got to be like, then it's up to me to, to remind you that you're my choice. You were my choice yesterday. You're my choice today. And, you know, we keep doing what we're doing. You'll be my choice forever. That, so it is, it's a partnership. It's, it works in tandem, you know. And, it, and then you also have the responsibility of, like, again, doing the work to examine yourself to say, like, where is this coming from? Is this coming from a place because, you know, I'm frustrated about work and I've been wanting to start my own business and I've been fearful? Like, you got to keep digging, you got to keep digging, too, to figure out, like, have I not done the thing that I, I keep hearing that the Holy Spirit keeps telling me, start that podcast or take that real estate course and get your license or whatever? Is that part of the reason that this is being activated in me is because I feel stuck and I haven't I haven't taken the risk or I haven't followed through and taking taken the leap of faith to pursue my dream and what it is I want to do. So now I'm jealous of the people who have. Because it's it's, it's more than just, oftentimes what's operating requires, it requires digging deeper and continuing to ask those questions. But it is absolutely incumbent upon me to create and keep creating an environment where he feels safe or your partner feels safe to reveal those things to you and to listen with empathy and compassion and grace. You know? I, I like that you said that. And the reason I ask that is because Women now they're getting the bag, mm -hmm. you know, they are heavily invested into businesses where they do have the opportunity to meet other men. Just have generally other options. Mm -hmm. And even when it comes to social media, you will have men to express, hey, I don't prefer my woman. I think Tyshawn actually, I'm not sure if that was on or off camera. I'm not, uh, they prefer their women to not be in the limelight, so mm -hmm. to speak, to have less of a following. Mm -hmm. Now, not everybody's in entertainment, right? But mm -hmm. even yeah. if you got, you know, 100,000 followers that, or 10,000, mm -hmm. that might be too much for yeah. a man. And I hear women, you know, are frustrated by this. They're like, hey, just because I'm doing X, Y, Z, and I'm amongst these very qualified men, from the outside, because we don't really know what they got going right. on, right? But from the outside perspective, these very qualified men, it doesn't mean that I still can't be operate with integrity. And when I hear that, I usually think, well, and they, and they upset with the men, like these men are just insecure. And I think, well, okay, it's possible. The men might be insecure about it. That's possible. But it's two sides Absolutely. To, the, to the story. You gotta, here, here's the thing. We know you have to continue to look at the fruit. Like, how much of their life are they publicizing? How much of their life are... Because that is definitely a potential threat, right? Right. It's like, do they put everything out there? When they're upset, are they, like, putting all these quotes and, like, he ain't... You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right, what, right, right, right. like do, do they have a spirit that even in frustration or anger or whatever, that, that, where they can moderate themselves? 
Because you can tell those things. Also, like, are they following a bunch of buff, you know, strappy... Like, I, t- I can tell a lot about a person based on who they follow. Mm. Yes. I can tell a lot about you based on who you are following. I look at that before I get intimidated by how many followers you have. I'm looking at, what are you looking at? What do you consume? Mm-hmm. What have you decided you want to continually see in your feed? Because if it's a bunch of big booty Instagram chicks, then I'm probably not your girl. Mm. I'm probably not your girl. And also how you choose to present yourself. Now, I want to ask you this, too. Yes. Because as a woman who is, first of all, before the show even started, I, I love you. It was like, my goal is to be married. Yes. Yeah. Right? You want a husband. Yeah. So there's like a certain presentation to that especially as a woman of faith. Mm-hmm. This is what men say they want. <laughs> right. Oh, wait, 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 Because I, I, uh, that's part of, again, that sober mindset is that I get to see the incongruence in a lot of people. Oh, mm. hold on. Oh, <laughs> What is that? You, you try to see, pretty much, that's the good nice way of saying BS. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. <laughs> that's well, pretty much what she just pulled out. And, and, it, and it, you know, it could be incongruent. But this is what men say they want. Mm -hmm. So, okay, this was years ago, but I was on a date with someone that I had been on a few dates with, and I hadn't seen them in a while, and they asked me to have brunch, and so I said, okay, and I met them at this beautiful location in Malibu, and we're sitting at brunch, and he's like, so what you been up to, and we're catching up or whatever, and he goes into this whole thing about missing me, right? I've been missing you, whatever, and I'm like, well, I've been here, like, (laughs) <laughs> you know, which a lot of people say is a very kind of like passive aggressive way or like a shirking responsibility, not really the most transparent approach. Right. But I've been missing you. And I said, well, I've been here. I said, but I think and I said this to him because this is how I talk. <laughs> I said, you know, I think that you have to make a decision because you say you want I said, but what I see you pursuing is something else. And mm. what I can tell you is, is that it, it's not a judgment of you. I just think you need to reconcile what the truth is because he had parents who'd been married for a long time and that's what he was espousing, right? I want what my parents got and da 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 da. I'm like, but what you're chasing and what you're positioning yourself for is something else. So I don't think that you'll ever be happy or satisfied until you reconcile within yourself what you're re- what the truth of what it is you want is. I said, because what I can tell you is that as much as I appreciate the success that you've amassed, because he was successful, and, you know, I said, and I appreciate what you've done, and it's admirable. You are self-made, and you have done incredible things on your journey. I said, but there's no amount of dinners that you will ever buy for me that will get my panties off. So you really need to figure out what it is that you think you have to offer and what it is that you think I value, because it's never going to happen without real investment and that's not what you do and I get that that's satisfactory for some others but it's not enough for me mm. and that was the last time we had brunch wow. and you said that's not what he does so he choose so typically you find that this is the kind of brother that doesn't really invest much takes you on a nice date probably hits you with some smooth words and tries to advance the sex essentially is what it is mm-hmm. I mean Quinn's a central player here yeah so but, and, but sells no, the, no, no, and then no, no, sells the no. dream of Marriage. Right. But, it, but you know, you have to, again, you have to, like, uh, it's really, and I'm not about judging someone, but I think it is about a level of honesty. Like, you really do have to tell more with yourself. Like, what is it that you really want? I said, because I get you have options. You're handsome. You're successful. You will have options forever. So it really is in your hands, your fate. I don't know what to tell you, bro. It, that's why I was like, I've been here. So you can tell me I'm great all you want, but you're not pursuing me and I know why. Mm. Because I require too much. And that's all right. I'm okay with that. What do you mean by that, though? What do you, what do you mean? You re- what do you require? I require discipline and intention. And I require a level of, like, investment in terms of time. And, you know, what? It, it's like... You can say, oh, I took her to this restaurant, I took her to that restaurant, and I'd be like, well, what's my favorite color? I hate that question. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I get what you're saying. You, it's, it's, not, it's not really, well, actually. 
And it is, it is. Let me, I'm interrupting just for a moment too, because going back to your earlier yeah. point, I can do it myself. Mm. I, can, I can pay for whatever restaurant I want to go to myself. Yeah. I have a nice car. I have a nice house. I have friends. I have a successful career. So I am emancipated to a certain extent because I don't, those things don't entice me. So it, it, it kind of is a what do you bring to the table that's not material. That is something that's compelling. Mm. You, have, you find that brothers are oh. having a hard time bringing those immaterial characteristics that absent, you are looking for to the table? Absent of the things that we focus on. I mean, we live in the United States of America. It's a capitalistic place. So, you know, we are sold this, this um, dream of what it is to have success. And, you know, for someone like me, you know, I, I met Matthew Perry uh, right before, right after he had done the pilot for Friends, before it had aired. And we had a conversation because I had just done a pilot for something and we were talking and he was all excited because Jimmy Burroughs had directed Friends. And if you know anything about comedy, then you know that James Burroughs is like the creme de la creme of directors. He had directed Cheers and all of these amazing shows, you know, he put the stamp on. And so Matt was very excited about Jimmy Burroughs having directed the pilot for Friends, right? And he had no idea the success that was coming and it happened and when you see someone achieve that kind of success literally the number one show in the world dating some of the biggest movie stars mm -hmm. on the planet becoming a hundred millionaire and then they become an addict you recognize that those material things are not success they're not they make things easier, but they can also make your demise easier. Mm. And so I am very fortunate to have had a close periphery view of a friend of mine fall, who, whose life fell apart post getting everything they ever wanted. So I know I'm, I'm grateful for the, for the wisdom. I'm grateful for the perspective of knowing that that ain't it, son. Mm. there's more to it than that. So when you know that, I, I, that's what I mean by I demand more. I demand you to have a better sense of self than your black card and your, and your Ferrari. You got to have a better sense of self. Because what if, God forbid, what if Kevin Hart didn't walk away from that accident and was stuck in a wheelchair? Thank God that's not what happened. Right. But what if? What happens then? So you got to have more. You got to have more internally. You got to value yourself from a different place than just your prowess and again your your credit cards and your status and your awards and all that stuff. Like it's doing the work. Are you doing the work to be to be to cultivate peace regardless of circumstance? Because when you walk down the street and you are aware, I saw somebody the other day, I was driving on Ventura Boulevard in, in California and I saw, I saw a person literally face plant, face down at the curb of the sidewalk, knocked out. I don't know if they were passed out, I don't know if they were drugged out. And I see that and I go there, but by the grace of God go I. When you look at people, when you walk around the earth and you really look at people in their most downtrodden, in their most broken place, and you know that that could be you under different circumstances, it shifts you. And it shifts you towards gratitude, and it shifts you towards being present, and it shifts you towards avoiding judgment, and it shifts you towards believing that it'll never happen to me. I just don't buy that. Mm. So before the show, I mentioned about, um, you know, I, I assume men were just beating your door down. <laughs> That's what I assume. I just beat my door down. Now, by the way, can, we, can give... we also go into essence? Can we tell the people your age? Yeah, Is of course. Okay? Was it 51? 51. I'll be 52. Which blew February us away. 7th. It's 50. Crazy. One I was years. <laughs> I mean, mathematically, in. it makes sense because I grew up on Smart Guy, mm -hmm. right? 
97. But came I out. still, I don't know, in my mind, I still was like, it didn't make sense. Yeah. <laughs> no, there's no way. Yeah, right, right. Crazy. But yeah. go Incredible. Ahead. Go ahead. No, so before, that, that was my assumption. Mm -hmm. You know, you coming in as a woman of faith, you're beautiful, you got this career, you talk about investing into your femininity, mm -hmm. you talking about wanting to be in a long-term relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm like, man, this, it has to be men beating your door down. <laughs> but now, though, yeah. after this past two, three minutes, I understand why men are not doing that. Mm. Because it is a lot. Because the average man is not willing to do all of that. Mm -hmm. Because you would literally have to be a better person. Even the above average man. Even the above average man. And I think that's why many of us men have an aversion to commitment. Mm -hmm. Not because the sex thing, I can't sleep with the, the right. one woman. One yeah. woman. Mm -hmm. I don't think that's it. It's the reality that you have to be better. You have to be more responsible. Mm -hmm. You have to be more disciplined. Mm -hmm. And you're going to have somebody right next to you staying down, mm -hmm. holding you accountable. Holding you accountable. That's a very scary thing for men. Because it literally means, for most men, you probably have to change everything about you. Mm. And I think that is the reason why most men are like, I don't know about marriage. Right. What it really is, not I don't know about marriage, is I don't know if I'm willing to commit to being better. But I want to know what your opinion is. Why do you think men are apprehensive about long-term relationships? Um, I, you know, one of the things that I know is operating is, you know, I believe that things happen in the spirit first. And one of the things that I think is happening is just the unchecked lust. I do believe that that is definitely playing a part of things. You know, it's like the the way that the culture and that sex and sexuality is so at the forefront, right? It is creating a numbing of the sacredness and the specialness of sex. I think pornography plays a part in that. I think just the dulling down of like what intimacy and the special sacredness of intimacy is. And I say all this to say, I'm not a person who's like, I have them, you know, like I believe my body <laughs> is valuable and, and special, but I, I'm not going to be that person who's like, Oh, once you get with me, it's like, you're never going to like, I just <laughs> think that that's, if you have no experience, then maybe if you have moderate experience, I don't know, but I just, it's not a, an arrogance thing that would make me say that it is about intimacy is meant to be something that we treasure and that we value and I think that because there's so much imaging there's so, so there's just a cacophony coming at us at all I mean in commercials and all these ways that we access bodies that they have that everyone has become just a body like I'm not seeing Sandra Nelson's daughter Jeffrey Atkins daughter she's been through x y and z she has she comes from here she grew up here she's I'm not seeing that I'm just seeing a body and as long as we are not valuing and really seeing each other and taking the time to invest in in each one's story in the way that you guys do with each other's friendships then I think that that's a big barrier in terms of like being able to commit to someone because if you know, it's one of the reasons in hostage negotiations, I don't know if you've ever seen movies where they're always like, make sure that you say their name when the, when the parent pleads for the child's returns, say their name because the hostage negotiator says, once the child becomes a person, it's harder to harm the child. Once you become a person to me, it's harder for me to harm you. But if you're just a body, I can act with impunity. I can act with cruelty, with violence, and just disregard you. But once I'm invested in your story, it's harder to do that. And I think that that's a big part of the problem. Mm. So a lustful culture. Yes. I can imagine it's a bunch of women listening to this right now. Like sis preach. That's what they, that's what they saying. <laughs> that's what they saying. Right. But these same women, mm. I think would have been sitting across, across and on that same brunch date you went on <laughs> with that eligible bachelor. Yes. They would have been sitting across from him. Hopped in the passenger seat of that Ferrari. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Where we going next? It, right. 
And see, that's my that's my question. That's my concern is that, you know, what do you say to the woman who is like, hey, I want to be this person, this woman of integrity mm -hmm. and be disciplined and hold myself together, even in front of the most illustrious mm -hmm. bachelor on the planet that's that's lusting after me or, or wants me. But I just can't do it. Or every time I fall victim mm -hmm. to this to this man or the next man, mm -hmm. what do you say to that woman? Like, how do you, you know, get that woman straightened out, so to speak, so she can now actually stick with it, so she can be essence, so to speak, and operate with this integrity, uh, and you know, discipline. and discipline. So and it's 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 a few things, but. I, I'm gonna narrow it down to the cross, right? The cross goes this way and the cross goes this way. So it's about everyone, but you asked me about women. It's about what is your, again, identity? Where is your identity coming from? Is it coming from what this man across from you, this eligible bachelor thinks, or is your identity coming from the Lord God who made you? Is your identity coming from believing in yourself and your worth and your value enough to to stand, to stand and go, the things that I want in this life don't have to come through another person. They can come through me, but it's going to require me making decisions and it's going to require me having discipline to make those things happen. But I can, I can actually accomplish what it is I see myself as having without having to go through this man. So there's that. But it's also about community the cross going this way. Who is around you? Who is Who are you putting yourself in the room with? Who are you spending time with? Who are you calling when things don't work out the way that they, sh that they should or the way that you thought they would or that you wanted them to and they don't? Who is feeding into your soul and your spirit when those things happen? Because that's on another critical aspect of our identity and being able to stand is who is feeding us and who is speaking to us and what are they saying and are they affirming us in a way of like you know girl you don't need him just go ahead and go out there and get the next or are they saying well what were you attracted to him and how when I when he said he was gonna call you and then he didn't did he ever explain why he didn't call you like that just shows a lack of integrity his yes is and his yes and his no and his no like biblically if I say I'm going to meet you, if I don't meet you, there should be a legitimate reason why I don't. And I need to explain that just because I want to I want to be held accountable and I want you to trust me. So if I'm not if my word is not bond, then you can't trust me. So if I don't have an explanation for you, it's not about you being grown. It's about you caring about someone else's feelings and their time. So it's those kinds of things that the people around you need to be speaking from not a f him many this and you know what i mean because that i don't believe that there's eight billion people on the planet you tell me all men ain't no it's really about perspective and so it's a it's a perspective thing in terms of your who god says you are but it's also a perspective thing in terms of the community around you and the advice that they're giving and how they're speaking to you because when we're winning we're winning mm -hmm. <laughs> but when when life happens, because life be lifing, who is talking to you and what are they saying and where are they leading you? What are they trying to get you to go back to or move on to or move up to? And that's an important thing to, to and that you do have within your control. Once you're out of your parents' house, you can, you can decide who you're going to spend time with and how you're going to spend your time. And that really is the onus is on you then. I like that. I, I like that because... I think, you know, uh, women as well as men, you get these people who can really challenge your defenses. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason probably why that man continued to go on brunch with you is because he probably met a, a, a essence before you, except for that essence. She went on the fourth date <laughs> the, or the, the other essence. She went on the 10th brunch. Right. right. So he's continuing to try and try again until finally he's just like. You know, so men will hear what a woman is doing and how she operates and will still challenge that woman yeah, and try of course. to persuade that I mean, woman. listen, you guys are hunters, right? Yes. It's, it, it's part of the biology of how you're wired. So, but, but again, it's about, we talked about incongruence, right? If I, if I tell you that what I'm looking for is a husband, what I want is a husband, then I have to, again, I have to position myself and move accordingly. 
You know what I mean? And so when I do that, I'm showing you, I'm not just telling you, but I'm showing you that I mean it. And so either you're in alignment with that. Amos 3.3 says, how can two walk together unless they agree? We're not going to walk together unless you agree because this is the walk that I'm on. So you're either going to meet me there and we'll walk together towards this goal or you can go whichever way you want to go. No judgment. You're just in, you're moving in another direction. You have another destination. It's OK. And see, that's the thing. Ladies got to understand that like men will test and th they'll push against and really test the strength mm -hmm. of your resolve. of your discipline of course. and your resolve in that area. Just how you guys test us in other ways mm -hmm. as well. But. You got to make sure that. But that's also you very telling. Through. I was I was actually close to getting married again. I was in a relationship with someone. It was very serious. But part of how I knew he wasn't ultimately the person I should be with is because I told him this is getting very difficult for me. Meaning abstaining because I'm on an abstinence journey. I said this is getting very difficult for me. I need your help. And. There were so many reasons that I was really honest with him about for why I was wanted to do it this way and what I was what the goal was. And he was on board. But then we got to this place and I was like, this is getting very difficult for me because and I said to him, I said this, I know what you look like. I know what your DMs look like. I'm sure if you wanted ass, bleep me out if you need to. No, if you, want, if you wanted ass, you know, you could get it. And it's very difficult for me to keep feeling like I'm rejecting you because I don't want you to feel rejected. So I need you to come up so that you are actually shepherding us in this thing. Because at this point, you've said you want to do this with me. So I need you to step up and lead this thing and not have me pull you and keep having to tell you no because it's making me feel, it's making my resolve. And the fact that he wasn't able to do that said to me, he ain't my husband. Mm. Wow. I'm, so it's we a had a lady struggling with that. When we had a conversation, we had a couple of people call in on the episode that was asking about that. What should you do in that situation where the woman or the man expresses that they want to abstain, but the partner continues to break, try to have sex, try to have sex, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. how you should operate in that. Mm -hmm. So does that mean that that alone? Was that the only point of concern? No, there were other ways where I saw that. The imbalance. Yeah, like y'all wasn't yeah, on the same page. Yeah, there were other things that happened that his word wasn't in alignment with his behavior. Got yeah. it. And I was like, ooh, no, that's, yeah. that. And listen, I'm not a perfect person. It's not that I don't mess up. But I move with an intention and I move with a consistency that, <laughs> the shirt. I move with a consistency <laughs> that um, people know, you know, and I'm I, I have a reputation and that reputation is of being this person. People, if you were to he, people who meet me or talk like that's part of the beauty of even in my career. Right. And I've said this, I'm very proud of a lot of the work that I've done. I brought up the Waynes family, but a lot of the work that I've done over the years, Yvette Lee Bowser, has been repeat business. It's not because I'm the most talented actor there is. There's plenty of incredibly talented, beautiful black women that people could hire. But what I can tell you is that part of the reason that I get the job over some of them is because people want to be with me at 2 o'clock in the morning because they know I'm going to show up, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to rally, I'm not going to complain, I'm going to be a collaborator, and I'm going to be respectful. And that makes a difference mm. when you want to write a check. Because you have long days, you have difficult days, you have, oh my gosh, we're losing the sun. Is this person going to be prepared? Is this person going to be on time? Is this person going to be difficult? And when, those, when that is not the narrative around your name, that can make the difference between you getting a job and not getting a job. Facts, because that peace of mind is worth every penny. Every single penny. People write me checks all the time for the peace of mind. Absolutely. Not just because I'm talented. Man. You just, help, you just help some, one, of the, yes. one of the ladies, at least one. But to be clear, she didn't end the relationship because he was trying to have sex with her, but because his actions was not congruent with his words. Yes. And at this that's point, clear. that's very important to you that you abstain all the way till marriage at this season of your, in this season of your life right now. 
I'm nodding and because <laughs> Lord, it's sometimes I'd be like, Lord, it's really difficult because I just don't see how this is going to happen. Cause there's, cause to your point, there's not an active like pursuer. There's not, I don't, I don't get asked out all the time. So I'm like, Lord, I'm standing, I'm standing on what you asked me to do. And it's real lonely. Like, you know, it's funny because I was in a hotel uh, in Temecula. I, my best friend and I went to Temecula and we did a hot air balloon ride on Sunday, Dope. like a pre-celebration of her birthday. She always wanted to do it, so we did it together, spa day or whatever. But when we were leaving the hotel in Temecula, I looked at the bed I had been sleeping on and I just laughed to myself. I didn't say anything to her because I sleep with a pillow. You know, being married for oh, seven years, I was used to sleeping with somebody. And so now I sleep with a pillow next to me, like to mimic a body. And so I looked, I looked at my bed and I was like, there's a dang pillow. Just, to, you know, the extra pillow from the bed. Cause there were four pillows on the bed that was like kind of behind me. And I'm like, Ugh, Lord, this pillow, <laughs> <laughs> I'm over it. I get it. Tell me not this season of your life though, cause mm. this is a new season. Mm hmm. What is most important now? Because you talked about why the brother did not make it. Mm. Why, and y'all were engaged. Mm -hmm. why, why that didn't make it now. Mm -hmm. What's the most important thing now that a brother needs to bring for us to make it all the way through <laughs> the engagement and run through the line? I, it, I mean, I think it's the things that I've talked about, but it's really about a vulnerability and a willingness and a consistency and a joy. You know, to have joy. Does he have joy? Does he like his life? Does he like his friends? You know, everybody always gives you that, well, what's his relationship like with his mama? It goes beyond that. What's his relationship like with himself? Can he sit in stillness? Mm. You know, when he's home, is he, you know, numbing himself watching porn because he don't have nothing to do? Or is he like reading a book? Like what's, what are his habits? What, what is, what's, being cultivated like those things are important and listen i don't want everybody calling me talking about they believe porn is believe what you want to believe about pornography but there's been plenty of of expert opinions about how bad it is for relationships oh yeah ain't nothing yeah. healthy about it <laughs> okay ain't nothing healthy um, about it. but and and i am someone who used to watch porn i haven't watched porn since 2018 and i love that i haven't it was a struggle for me um, I'll reveal to you guys. I, I discovered porn when I was a child. My mom's boyfriend had it. And so I consumed porn all as a teenager, as a young adult. And when I became a believer, I believed that pornography was keeping me and helping me abstain, like helping me wait kind of, help me not, you know, wow. like try and like wait on my husband by like, you know, feeding this appetite in a way that wasn't interactive. But there was this point where I realized like it, it was just numbing me what we were talking about, right? The images, the lack of like regard and sacredness and sacrosanct of, of bodies and just seeing people as parts and all that other stuff. And in 2018, clear as day, Holy Spirit was like, don't do it again. And I was like, oh, and I was like, and it was a day by day thing. I was like, okay, well, I didn't do it today. Okay, you know, it's like an addict, right? I didn't. A drink lot of today. people think that though. Yeah, they think porn keeps me disciplined, disciplined. and loyal, or and, loyal, and away from trouble. Yeah, and I move. I, I I take this out of my life and I replace it with something else toxic. Right, <laughs> right. right, and that's what happens. I, you got to kill that thing. You got to kill it. So so it sounds like if you were to meet a man and you found out that that was something that he was a habit he's, he's created, that would be a pretty much a deal breaker for you. I'm not going to say it would be a deal breaker because I also trust that if he's my person, then there could be part of the reason he encountered me is to help him break free of this thing. I like that mindset. You know what I mean? Like, I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, subvert what God could be doing. But I'm going to seek wisdom. I'm going to seek counsel. I'm going to pray about it. We're going to pray together about it. I'm going to really listen when I ask him about it, when I'm saying, so why do you do this? What do you think about this? Do you ever consider? Like, we're going to have conversations around it. I'm not going to dismiss it overall. You know what I mean? Because 
again, part of the beauty of my life, which I'm so grateful for, is that I have an experience with a lot of different kinds of personalities, a lot of different kinds of people, a lot of people with different kinds of brokenness. And so that has fostered an empathy in me. And also what I do for a living, right? Again, if I'm playing a character who has this set of brokenness, I can't judge that brokenness. I got to understand it. I got to have compassion for it. And I got to be able to substantiate it to a certain extent to play that character and do it well. So because I have this practice and because it is part of how I make my living and, and just my love of what I do, because my love of storytelling is for that reason as well, I'm going to have a conversation. We're going to keep having conversations. If all these other things are working and this is something that, you know, I'm going to hear, is he adamant that he needs this? Is he insistent that this is okay? Like we're going to have to extract that we're gonna have to like talk about it we're gonna have to dig through that and rummage through it and come to some sort of alignment or perhaps it would be the reason why we didn't work but I don't want to make a I don't want to make a hard line like we're we're complex personalities I think that we need to if if everything else on the table is working then that is something potentially that we could work through it really depends on his mindset and our level of communication, which is going to tell us a lot anyway about right. the about the possibility and potential of us having a doing life together for, you know, hopefully another 40, 50 years. What does that look like? You got to be able to work through the hard stuff. You got to be able to work through the hard stuff, because no matter how much preparation you have, no matter how much planning you have, there are things that are going to happen in life that you can't COVID. We couldn't prepare for that. Mm -hmm. No. Couldn't prepare for that. That's not something that any of us were like, oh, yeah, we know this is going to happen, and we were ready. And a lot of relationships ended because of that. You know what I'm saying? So we're going to have to work through some sort of hardship, and this may be the beginning initiation into what kind of partners we make long term and how we talk about that particular thing. Man, Essence, I, love, I just love your, your optimism and, and even this radiance that you have still, yeah. you know, at, because I, I, I'm gonna tell you about the live. We had the live last night, and we had a young lady who pretty much lost all hope. Not really necessarily a young lady, but mm. uh, what she was, was her 63. Name? She was 63 years old. Yeah. And can you tell what, what she actually said more specifically in the in the post that she put up? So she stated that um, she appreciated you know myself and Tyshawn for the platform. She thanked the guest as well, and she mentioned that she had prior to finding faith, she had lived a worldly life. Mm -hmm. And she pretty much um, advised anybody watching that, hey, get your stuff together now or you will end up like me at 63 years old where it's too late for me, mm -hmm. is what she mentioned. And, um, you know, that was just, I mean, that just really caught me off guard, mm -hmm. you know, because I thought that was sad and upsetting because, and it's somebody who supports us, somebody, you know, we care about, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, she mentioned that it was too late for her. And I think that is many women, whether they're 63, mm -hmm. many men, whether they same age or, or any, any age, mm -hmm. where they're like, hey, I've lived my life so wrong. That's what they think, that wherever I'm at now, it just, it's just... It's at the point of no return. It's no return. You're still breathing. That's not true. It's a lie. It's a lie meant to keep you in bondage. It's a lie meant to stagnate you. That's a lie meant to depress you. That's a lie meant to completely amputate the rest of your days. That's a lie meant to undermine your joy. If you're alive, there's still hope. There's still the possibility of reconciliation of some kind. There's still the possibility of it may not look like what you thought it would look like but there's still the possibility of love because again love doesn't necessarily have to be romantic I mean I one of the great joys of my life is my relationship with my best friend and I tell people all the time we're like platonic soulmates like she's just dope she she's 15 years younger than me and what it has done is it has infused me with a hope that I didn't have before I met her because she sees things, her lens of me and what's possible for me is different. And it has galvanized me and encouraged me in such a way that I am doing things that I never would have imagined that I could still do. 
you know, even though I'm, I'm still a middle aged person, there were certain things that I kind of believed there was a box that I had put myself in, in terms of my creativity. I only saw myself as an actor and she was like, you're so much more than, than what you think of yourself as. And again, just going back to the fruit of things, the alignment and the agreement that I've come into in our friendship, I've done more things in terms of I've accomplished more, I've made more money, I've helped more people, I've done things that I just would never have thought I could do. But it also required a person kind of, again, that relationship, right? This, this community relationship of someone looking at me and feeding into me the possibilities that were so hope infused, that were so helpful, mm. that were so, you know, full of, of joy and possibility. Um, so I'm really grateful for a perspective that was outside of my own that said, no, you're more than that. You're yeah, greater yeah. than that. And we have to be very yeah. careful, like the stories that we tell ourselves. What because we come into agreement with, yeah. That those those stories that we tell ourselves and what we accept and what we believe become beliefs. Yes. And it becomes true to you. It becomes your reality. Mm -hmm. And I don't care what people might tell you the odds are at this point in time and this age for you to find this and that. And people might say you're delusional for thinking that you can do this and do that. I'm going to be honest, like you said, if you have breath in your body and you want something, listen, be delusional. Go after, I mean, to be honest, it's delusional for me and Ryan to think that we can have a podcast and have S's <laughs> Atkins Extremely delusional. right here. It's delusional to think that you can be a millionaire in today's society and actually create something coming from the neighborhoods that many of us have come from. Yes. A lot of dream chasers are delusional. Mm -hmm. The only bad part about being delusional is when you're not willing to work for it. Mm-hmm. When you're actually willing to put the work and the effort behind your delusion, mm -hmm. that's when you start becoming a genius. <laughs> right. Exactly. Right? So yeah. the thing, so y'all really have to be very careful about what you choose to accept mm. as your reality yeah. in this lifetime. So that's just very important because again, when I'm here, when I'm here listening to you, I'm just like, it's I just different. feel this ball of optimism. <laughs> like, the way S, S's energy, she might walk outside. It's gonna get hollered at right now. <laughs> right, right, like, right, don't, right. Y'all don't understand. Right. Like, somebody, somebody could be walking. Somebody past. about to holler. At, like that. That's the. That's the <laughs> <laughs> so that's just what it is. Listen, S is not not everybody is on. You know, have that mindset on the, the far end of the spectrum. Mm. We got some people in between, mm. right? You got the single mothers out there who are like, hey, I know I'm not. You know, I'm I'm done. You know, I'm just gonna find me somebody to be companions with. The older women, we got older men who are just going to settle with being sugar daddies or the cougars. Or one thing, and this is what I hear a lot, especially from dating experts and relationship experts, that men or women particularly of, you know, 50 plus, mm -hmm. companionship. And this is okay. Companionship. Not marriage. marriage. Mm -hmm. But just companionship in whatever package that comes. Mm -hmm. I'm very curious to what you think about that, the woman or the man who just decides to be a cougar or a sugar daddy, or the woman who's just like, you know what? <laughs> I just want to be, I, I just want a companion. I mean, I see how people get there. Is, is that, I, do you think that's some level of kind of mailing, it, up. mailing yes, it in? Yes, I do. But I understand why people get there. Just like I understand people who want to be, who want to have a sugar daddy. You know, to believe in yourself and to do the work, to your point, to get where you believe you should be, that's a different level of work and ethics and discipline and and having to deny certain things, right? That's not, that requires more of you. So I get why you want to be like, you know what, I'm... I'm cute. Let me just, <laughs> let right. me just you know, I, I understand. It's hard out here to make it happen um, on your own. So I, I do get that, but I don't, and again, I don't want to seem judgy if that, if that's what you're doing, if that's what you've decided, that's between you and your maker. But as for me in my house, I, I, I am audacious enough to believe I can have what I want. That's the word. I like that. That's the word. Yeah. Audacious. I think our culture really shrinks our audacity. Yeah. I think it really shrinks our audacity. 
I don't think we have a very audacious culture. I mean, maybe a little outrageous, <laughs> <laughs> but not audacious. Because I think to to be audacious is to say that I, you know, I can create these things that I truly want. Because I think a lot of people that have settled for those lifestyles, they don't really want that. Like if they no. really tap deep, yeah, and they but, peel the layers back. That you, was my thought. If you look, there's a a woman who wrote a book. She was a a hospice nurse and she wrote a book about the regret of the dying I think that even might be the title of the article or the book the regrets of the dying wow. one of the biggest regrets of people wow. on their deathbed is that they wish that they had had the belief in themselves to pursue the life that they wanted to pursue mm. I mean if it's in the top five of, and this, you know, when you're in working in hospice, that's all cultures, all religions, all ages, you know, you're watching people at their end of life. And if that is a common regret, then you got to know that there is, there is resistance to you having the life you want. There is resistance. If you're waiting for the resistance to be gone, you will be waiting and find yourself dead. Or, you know, you'll, you'll find yourself on your deathbed going, oh my gosh, I wish I had tried. I don't want to be at the end of my life with a bunch of woulda, coulda, shouldas. Lessons, wisdom, hopefully not a whole lot of regrets, but um, a, a legacy of, of having shared what I learned and having left people better in some way or another, at least not hurt them, right? As Tabitha says, you know, don't, don't go messing up anybody else's day, mm -hmm. right? Um, so I do have that as an end goal, and I, but I don't, I'm, I'm willing to look foolish. That's the other thing about audacity. You gotta be mm -hmm. willing to look foolish. Yep. You know, Noah looked real dumb till it started raining. He looked real crazy. <laughs> That's a good point. I'm happy you said that though, because the companion thing is just, you know, because we've seen it. If you if you've grown up with single mom household, yeah. single single grandma, you done seen the companion. He was around when you was ten. Yeah. Came back when you was fifteen. Uncle so and so. Uh, uh -huh. <laughs> right, right. You done seen him. Yeah. And I when I and when I hear women say that that's what they want, I'm like, that's really not what you want because that's convenient. But again, it it goes back to what I was talking about in terms of identity and hope and like, and also learning learning to be okay, learning that that the incubator right in the darkness and away sometimes is really like where growth happens you got to be okay with being in in an uncomfortable place mm. it's uncomfortable to be single and abstinent for as long as i've been single and abstinent it's not comfortable i'm not going to sit here and a spouse and be like it's the easiest thing in the world and but i can say that i see what god is doing in the process i see how he's growing me i see how i mean i talked about this on uh, in another um show but i the sensitivity i have like the way that i am it, it really does feel kind of like a renewed person because I am so sensitive to things now. My spirit is so sensitive that it doesn't require so much. You don't have to work so hard to like titillate me. You just don't because I'm so sensitive. You know what I mean? I'm like, oh, <laughs> the sound of his voice is kind of attractive. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? And, and it's really, it's, That's re dope. That's it's dope. really nice. It's really nice to be a new creation at 51, almost 52 years old. It's really nice. And to be renewed daily and to have my mind renewed daily and to be able to see things with a fresh perspective without being a mile up in the sky. Because, you know, it was pretty cool when I went in a hot air balloon two days ago and I was looking out and it's the first time I'd ever done that with my best friend. But it shouldn't, it, life shouldn't require those kinds of extremes for you to have appreciation and gratitude. That's just, that's part of the work that we're talking about. You know what I mean? That isn't relegated to getting the bag or getting the dude or going to the gym and getting muscles. That's like to have the peace, to have the peace of the spirit. Like that's something that needs to be worked on because there's resistance. And you know, resist, like the, when those major life events that happen that you didn't expect to happen that you might think beat you down a little bit, that that's when those that place of settling can really look real satisfying. Yeah. And 
divorce mm-hmm. is another event where that can happen a lot. Yeah. I know a lot of ladies after they divorce, they're like, you know what? I don't even need all that again. I, I said that initially. I mean, I was like, Ooh. wow. You know what I mean? But I, but it was a, it was a process. It took a while for me to like, and, and again, you know, I was really fortunate that having gone, having booked Marlon right after that happened, that really helped me, you know, cause again, I was partnered with somebody that I trust and love immensely. You know, Marlon and I joke all the time that he's Ralph and I'm Alice, you know, he's Fred Astaire, I'm Ginger Rogers. Like I'll go backwards in heels wherever you lead me. Cause I trust you. Right. We have that kind of friendship, which is beautiful, but it really helped me to play that character to play Ashley. Cause it helped me look at the lens of divorce with laughter and humor and, and be surrounded. That, that job was, was such a, a, a beautiful encapsulated experience for me because I got to heal and laugh. And I made a, an amazing friend, Brisha Webb in that process. We're still friends to this day. I was a bridesmaid in her wedding. Um, you know, I love, I call her husband, my big little brother, cause he's six, four <laughs> and, um, you know, he checks on me all the time and he's, he's an amazing man, Nick Jones Jr. And, and so, so many incredible blessings came, came from that experience. And, and again, you have to be open enough to like sit back and, and decide that I, I'm at this place in my life where it doesn't always feel good, but I trust the will of the Lord because he's good all the time. And so even if it doesn't feel good, it will be good. It's good for me, you know, and I try to, and as a mom, I can, I, I have a little bit of a micro into the macro that would be Elohim, which is that I understand that I never tell my son no arbitrarily. I'm telling him no to protect him. I'm telling him no to teach him. I'm telling him no so he can become more independent and learn how to do something for himself, to cultivate his own security, to cultivate his own trust in himself. There are reasons that I tell myself, my my son, no. I don't ever tell Varro no just to say no. And if I'm that way, as a parent, then I have to trust that God is that way in his love for me. Mm. I like it. Man, so it's the thing. Yes, it's, I like your standards and your expectations. These are, these, these are standards and expectations that I can respect. They can be very lonely. I can be an outlier sometimes. I know this. But at the same time, I trust that. Thank you for the compliment. Thank you. You buddy. either be yes. lonely or you sleep with the damn devil. I mean, it's like, right. like think that about part, it. I just sleep with the pillow. <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> I'm, I'm like this is not the after dark show i'm not even gonna it, right? <laughs> but but um yeah i mean i'm just down with that i just respect that and admire that so much and um you know because don't get me wrong some standards I, or expectations i got a problem with mm-hmm. i got a problem with a woman saying that she don't she's not gonna go on no coffee date i got a problem with that kind of expectation or that I, standard you know what i I, those things are really funny to me. I'm like, crazy. What? They're so crazy. Like those kind of weird absolutes. I'm like, any place can be special with the right person. Exactly. Oh my goodness. You know what I mean? Like really, truly, some of the best moments of my life are spent on a blanket at the beach. And some of those moments I'm by myself. But like, any place can be special with the right person. Like I, the way that my best friend and I belly laugh you know, in her apartment over puzzles. Like we do puzzles all the time. I'm really bad at it. She's really good. Um, But the way that we laugh and have joy, like if that were something that I found myself doing on a date, that would, with the right person, that would be amazing. Like we, we work together. We like were hovering over each other and we were trying to figure this thing out together. Wouldn't that be such a beautiful glimpse of what the future could look like? We have this thing. It's all. It's a mess. It's before us. It's it's not assembled. We know what it's supposed to look like. But now we're gonna work together to try and make it happen. And it may take commitment, depending upon how big the puzzle is. Could right. Be Ten piece could be five hundred. It may take some time. <laughs> but like, isn't there so much revealed in the process? You gotta, you gotta remember that things are revealed in the process, which is why things take time. Things worth having take time because there's revelation in that. You know what I mean? And, and there's there's no point in kind of like trying to skirt through that. Like it's, it's not, you know, always the most pleasant or how you want it. But and, and again, in in abstaining, there is revelation that happens and people are reveal themselves very quickly when they're not getting any. 
You know, they just, they reveal so much of their habits, their consistency or lack thereof, their integrity or lack thereof, whether or not their yes is yes. And they're not like so much is revealed and I am not dulled in my ability to see and perceive what is actually happening. I'm not in such a hormone euphoria that I have convinced myself that this thing is not like a major no, no. Mm. Cause I'm just worried about the right thing. Cause I'm floating on how good the D is like for Mm -hmm. real. You know what I mean? And that it is something that the God created it. The Lord made it to feel good. It is supposed to be an incredible experience, but without it being in covenant, without it being in intention, then I am like, I, it's, it's I, a drug. It's a drug. It's a drug. And it's risky. And, rela- and re- it's risky too. And relationships continue way past their expiration because of it. And you could miss out on something that's really wonderful because you're wrapped up in this thing that you are haunted by. You doped this up. thing, Yeah, man. <laughs> this is the reason it's called dopamine. I don't know if, if women really understand how simple men are. Like, if we know that if we need to hit you up because we want to have sex on a Wednesday, we need to hit you up on a Monday or a Tuesday, that's what we're going to do. If sex wasn't involved, you, you wouldn't be getting hit up. And that's, that's why my phone doesn't ring. Because it's clear. So if you call calling me, then you know. <laughs> right. <laughs> that's not happening on Wednesday. Right. So what else are we going to do? So you got genuine interest if you hit S's I up. I got right? genuine interest or I have no none at all. And mm-hmm. I, I am okay with that. Oh, S's, I got this it's, puzzle it's for okay. you. I got this puzzle we can do together. <laughs> right, right, That's right, why they hit right. me up. Uh, you got to be okay with that. You, got, you have to be okay with that. And as long as you're okay with that, I, I think that's cool. Because, no, no, you know, man, we're not, you know, we're not having side conversations. Like, oh, man, yeah, man, she, talking about she, ain't, she ain't having sex. She absolutely <laughs> nobody mad about that. That was not that was not conversations not going viral. Yeah. You know, mm-hmm. it's like we acknowledge that that's the case, and we say that's great for her, and I, I I'm just not interested, and, and we move on. And yeah. you know, and what? the right man and gonna I'm find you. I'm not mad at that at all. Exactly. I just need you to know yourself. Mm-hmm. I need you to know yourself and be honest about that, so that I can make an informed and uh, decision. You know what I mean? And that's part of where I think so much resentment comes from, right? It's because people aren't being honest. Mm -hmm. You know, we all talk about the representative, but I also think that there's a certain amount of time you spend in the incubator alone with yourself where you really got to come to what is it that you really want. You got to know yourself and be clear so that people are... Yeah, and, and again, it, it's on both sides. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I think there's a lot of women who the man is like, you know, I don't want a relationship. I'm just trying to, I'm not in that phase. And they're like, oh, yeah, that's great. And then the whole time they're like, I'm just going to give it to him so good that he's going to change his change mind you. and marry uh-huh. me. You know what I mean? Like, hear what people are telling you. Most of the time, unless someone's pathological, you know, in terms of like a <laughs> sociopath or a narcissist, they're, most of the time people are telling you the truth. They are revealing themselves. You just got to be disciplined enough to hear it. Are you listening or are you listening to the tape and the play and the script you have in your own head about what's happening? Or are you really listening to this man telling you he doesn't believe in monogamy? If he says that, that's probably true. What is appealing about making that up? Nothing. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> Nothing. So now, like, know what it is you're signing up for. You don't even attract those kind of brothers anymore, do you? I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. I have no idea. I don't know what's on the other side of the table. I just show up as me and see what happens. Mm. I mean, I remember before we started talking, you did talk about the repellent uh, piece a bit. Because I think that's important, too. Mm-hmm. We talked about that in the show, too. Yeah. You know, I, I just... Get into certain levels as men today. You should have seen the kind of woman I was attracting in high school. Very different today. <laughs> the ratchets. Right, yeah. No I bond. shouldn't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Because, yeah, that's, that's just not what we on. I mean, it's, it's, it's to the point where, like, now, at this point, if a young lady in that position in her life, she sees me, she might say something like, oh, he, he, he bougie. Right? Mm-hmm. Because... I have put myself in a position but where I have become unattractive to certain people on a di- in a different place in their lives. Absolutely. But here's what I love about what you just said. What I love about what you just said is that you are honest about the fact that it's been a process. 
Oh, yes. You know what I mean? Because who you were is not who you are. And hopefully it's not who you will be. Like you continuing, the trajectory of your life is into greater, right? The trajectory of your life is into more whole, more healed, more vibrant, more success, right? So, but what I love is that you don't have amnesia. And I think that's also part of where the resentment comes from is people make it and then they got amnesia about who they used to be. I, I, don't, I don't ever want to pretend that I didn't struggle with the things that I struggled with or that I didn't compromise in ways that I've compromised or I wasn't, I wasn't always this way. You're meeting me now here after many evolutions. And the only reason that I still talk about those things is to help someone else get free from where they are right now because where they are is where I used to be and I'm free from there. So it's important that that's why testimonies are so important because it's important for someone to understand that I didn't wake up like this. I didn't grow up in a house where we went to church. I didn't grow up in a house where I had some sort of like vague idea of God and belief in God. And if something was, you know, when my mom was fighting with her boyfriend, I would be praying to God, Lord, please kill him. You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like he ain't shit. You know what I mean? Like, you know, like whatever prayer it was at nine and 10 years old as he was beating the crap out of my mother. You know, I didn't grow up the way that Yvette Henderson grew up. I come from some stuff. But now the point of bringing that up now is to, to stay in touch with the compassion of that, to, to stay in touch with the, the empathy and the sympathy of what it is to be born into things that you had no control over and that you're born into and it creates trauma and it creates um, bad habits and it creates uh, and it kills dreams and it creates learning difficulties and, and focus difficulties and physical, like you got to have compassion for the people around you because everybody wasn't born into what you were born into. And so it's really important to exercise and remember when you get to that place that you have been working for and aspiring to your whole life not to turn your nose up at somebody who's not there yet but to look at them and to speak the possibility I got to speak the possibility you can reject it it's not I can't control what you do with the seed but I want to make sure that I'm planting a seed that says you can do it too you can get out too you can build again too you can break the generational curses that you come from too if I'm not doing that then truly I am not a success I'm just a, a warehouse hmm. where food is rotting and there's all these hungry people outside and my bar and my doors are barred and chained and that's something I'm going to have to answer to God for because he's going to be like, um, you're, you're not meant to be a dam. You're not, you're not, you're not meant to, you're meant to, we are meant to pour, but we have to, we have to fill ourselves up first, but we are meant to pour again, going back to that analogies, stagnant water smells. We're not meant to just be still and, and get it and hold on to it. And we're meant to share. We're meant to help. And it's not, just about resource that are monetary it's about helping people break free of things that they believe that they can't get out of but by saying you know what I used to be in that and I got out so that's what I think <laughs> sorry <laughs> like it got oh, super man. quiet no 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 no, no this <laughs> is you, when they walk up me, to the front thinking yeah and transform right here because yeah. this is what this you know this is what this show is about in particular it's about, you know, really giving the people information that hopefully can get really get that switch going to take them from here to here. And that's what we describe as transformation. Mm -hmm. And let me tell you, Essence, you came in here and you transformed somebody up in this joint. We got to get right as men, though, because we got these these beautiful women, you know, of faith that are abstaining to marriage and desire a long-term committed relationship. This is great. Like this is what we, this is what we asking for. Right. It's we asking beautiful. for more women like this. And, um, you know, me and you, obviously I'm sure it is a ton of women that are of the same mindset, but I think as men, we do have to step up and be the mayor of that, you know, and um, you know, just be consistent, and like you said, really I, understand. I'm not what we asking want. for anything that I'm not able to provide. I'm not asking. I'm not asking for what I can't do. 
I'm asking for partnership. And that doesn't mean that I can do everything a man can do. I mean, one of the things that I long for is for my son to see me with a husband so that my son can see what it looks like to be loved on mm. by a man. I want him mm. to have a, he he has an amazing father and I and who, whomever he is will know and understand that he is not to replace his father. But I do want my son to see what it looks like for his mom to be loved and loved well. So he can have that vision to then continue. That's important. And I think, I think as a culture, I don't, I don't know if we're doing a good job being the person or being whatever it is that we are requiring. I think that would just change things tremendously, especially in, man, social media has become a very dangerous echo chamber mm -hmm. where people are throwing out these very <laughs> irresponsible and almost unreasonable requirements and expectations of, you know, uh, the opposite sex. Yeah. When a lot of people are not qualified and not even on a material level, on an immaterial level mm -hmm. to get what they're asking for. And the reality of it is that's, and that is the work. Mm -hmm. That is the work. The work is to become everything you want to actually become that. And that's the be, do, have that process. Yeah. And I, I want to add one more thing. I think it's really, really important. We talked about accountability, but I think there's another A word that is really important, learning how to apologize. Mm. I think it's really important that people learn how to apologize. To who in particular? Uh, I think when you, to, to anyone that you've wronged or that you've hurt, but, but especially when it comes to relationships or the pursuit of a relationship I think it's really important to know how to apologize to take accountability for oh I said I was going to do this and I didn't do it and not you know not gaslight people and not make it about well but you know it, the minute the butt comes out you you've kind of like swept away the apology like really just taking ownership and saying I was and I practice it a lot there was somebody who reached out to me who wanted me to write the forward of a book that they were working on and I never got back to them. And the other day she hit me, you know, we follow each other on Instagram and she hit me and just said something sweet, uh, to something I had posted that was completely irrelevant to what, to the ask. And I wrote her back and I said, Hey, listen, I never got back to you on this request. And I'm really very, very sorry that I didn't respond. And I explained to her that I was grieving and that I was in a really stressed out state because there was a strike happening and I just didn't have the bandwidth. But I said, I really should have gotten back to you and I'm very, very sorry and I appreciate your grace. And she just said, you know, thank you for saying that and you don't have to explain, but I didn't hold it against you. But I needed to do that. She didn't require it and she clearly wasn't like not effing with me because I didn't, but I needed to, I needed to, to stand there and stand before her and say, you asked me something and I didn't respond to you and that's not okay. Even if she didn't require me to. I think that's a good practice. I do it with my son all the time when I don't have the bandwidth or I'm not focused. Um, I apologize to him. You know, mommy was distracted or mommy's thinking about something else and I'm sorry that I didn't give you. But I think it's, I think learning to take accountability and apologize to people is an important part of being in good relationships with people because we're not ever going to always get it right. We're not ever going to not make mistakes. We are fallible. This flesh suit makes us, makes us prone to making error. That's the, that's it's this thing, whether we like it or not is, is dying and corroding every single day. So that in itself lets you know that there are going to be flaws. You're, we are flawed. So it's an important skill set to develop to be able to apologize to people. That's beautiful. And there you have it. Somebody actually needed to hear that. And I hope you guys take that with you. As a matter of fact, just give me one thing in the bottom here mm -hmm. in the comments. Give me one thing that you're going to take and walk away with from this here episode because Essence Atkins has my spirit full. We have <laughs> here today 
Thank you. All the way from L.A. Uh -huh. Essence, I appreciate you coming up on here. I'm and so spending grateful time with you us. invited me. Thank you for having me. It's been really it's been a great conversation. I love for I live for things like this. I really do love mm. listening and talking and exchanging and, and helping people feel empowered to create the life that they imagine. Yeah. I mean, you full of you full of a lot to give and the way you're using your voice, you know, your platform and, you know, coming here even with us. I, I greatly appreciate that. Thanks. And we're very thankful. And hopefully this is not the last time. <laughs> I'm so hardly initiated, but we will see. But thank you guys so much for tuning into another episode, y'all. Y'all know we are working so hard to grow this platform. So please continue to do all that you guys are always doing. Every single like, every single subscribe. It truly helps us look a little bit more attractive for amazing people like Essence when they go to YouTube. Because you know right. they got to go to YouTube. They be like, how much is here? Oh, no, these brothers still growing. I'm not going to really. I'm not going to come <laughs> on yet. But see, when y'all hit that subscribe button, we look a little, a little bit more attractive to get the people that we need to feed you. All right? So thank you guys so much for tuning into another episode of Harley Initiated. We are out.